So what I'm going to talk about is uh, surgical management of extremity and truncal melanoma. We'll talk about surgical margins, lymph node staging, the sentinel node biopsy, a little bit on in transit disease, and then a little bit on metastatic melanoma. The melanoma incidence is increasing. It uh, used to be about 1 in 1,500 in the 30s. We're now at about 1 in 63 or 70 uh, of men and 1 in 79 of women. And uh, overall, the five-year survival is close to 90%, but uh, there is certainly a subgroup of patients with uh, node-positive melanoma and some of the more aggressive melanomas that have more, um, more challenges. Uh, this is just showing that uh, the incidence for melanoma is really increasing more than most other cancers. The only other cancer that's uh, increasing more is uh, thyroid cancer. This um, bar graph is really just pointing out that um, melanoma is common, especially in our younger patients. So the 15 to 29 percent group, uh, 15 to 29 year olds, it makes up 8 percent of all cancers. And then in the 30 to 50 year old group, uh, melanoma makes up about 6 percent of all cancers. So what are the risk factors? So fair skin, uh, red hair, blue eyes, uh, UV exposure. A history of significant sun exposure, uh, tanning beds, which we all know are not great, um, a history of atypical and congenital nevi, lots of nevi, and then a family or a personal history of melanoma. And that's why we get everyone to follow up with the dermatologists as well as with the oncologists. Because we know if you've... Nevi. Nevi is a spot. So it's um, like a spot on your skin. Um, we know there's about an 8% lifetime risk of a second melanoma if you've had one. This is part of why um, melanoma is increasing, uh, a lot more skin exposure. And then the tanning beds as well. As you know, the Melanoma Network of Canada was instrumental in uh, getting them banned for under 18-year-olds. So when we look at the melanoma subtype, these are kind of the four basic subtypes. Lentigo maligna, which is more commonly on the, on the head and neck, often in older patients. Superficial spreading melanoma makes up about 70% of all melanomas. Nodular melanomas, and then acral lentiginous melanomas. And those are the ones on the palms, on the soles of the feet, and underneath the nails. What I think we'll move toward in the future is a bit more of a molecular classification of melanoma. As you're probably aware, in the last three to five years, there's been a tremendous change in the treatment for melanoma. And we, uh, we have these mutations that we can look for on various uh, melanomas. The most common one is a BRAF mutation. It uh, happens in about 40% of patients, often in younger patients. And there are some targeted therapies if you have the BRAF mutation. And this is a special test that, um, that we order from the pathologist to do the molecular breakdown. There's an NRAS mutation in about 20% of patients. And then there's a CKIT mutation, which is in those acral, uh, acral lentiginous melanomas, so the ones on the palms and the soles of the feet. When we look at our classic staging of melanoma, um, there are three main factors. There's tumor factors, looking at the depth, ulceration, and then the mitotic count for um, the number of dividing cells per millimeter squared. We look at nodal factors. So this is where the sentinel node comes into play. So microscopic, i.e. I can't see it, versus big, um, bigger uh, deposits of melanoma, macroscopic. And then distant metastases. So depending on if you have distant metastases and where they are, will tell us about um, your stage. So what do we do if we have a nevi or an abnormal looking uh, mole? Well, usually what we'd prefer to do is something called an excisional biopsy. And that means removing the whole lesion with a one to two millimeter amount, margin around the nevi. And we go down to the subcutaneous fat. And that gives us, um, that tells us about the depth of the melanoma and helps us sort out uh, treatment. Sometimes we can't always do an excisional biopsy if the lesion's really large, if it's on the face or a more difficult area. So then we'll just do an incisional biopsy, taking out part of the lesion.
Uh, we do have um, a rapid diagnostic uh, unit at uh, Sunnybrook that we started a few years ago and family doctors can send in patients who have an abnormal looking mole and uh, one of the surgeons, myself or Dr. Lokong and the dermatologist look at the mole and we'll excise it on the same visit if, uh, if we think it's suspicious. So moving on to if you're diagnosed with melanoma, what do we do surgically? And typically surgery is the first step in a uh, patient's treatment. And there are two parts to the initial surgery. Um, there's the getting wider margins, which uh, the aim is to decrease the local recurrence of the melanoma. And then we'll also usually do something with the lymph nodes, depending on the depth of the melanoma. Um, sometimes uh, doing that wide local excision can be a little bit more complicated. Um, we get the plastic surgeons involved and we can do wider excisions um, or we do skin grafts or we do flaps. Um, so it's uh, good to go to a team where they have access to plastic surgeons and uh, can help if we need to. When we're looking at margins, we've come a long way over about 30, 30 years or so. We used to take five centimeter rims of tissue around melanomas, then we moved down to three centimeters, and now we're looking at one to two centimeters. And that narrower margin does not make a difference in uh, outcomes. So these are our Cancer Care Ontario guidelines at the moment. So for melanomas under a millimeter, we do a one centimeter margin. One to two is one to two centimeters and then a two to four millimeter depth is a two centimeter margin. There is a proposed trial, um, and we'll see if it goes ahead. It needs to be a very large trial of about 10,000 people, looking at even making the margins narrower, which potentially could make um, the need for some of these more complicated excisions um, less. So we're looking at a one to two, two centimeter margin for any melanoma greater than a millimeter. And if we do this study, it'll be a worldwide study because they need about 10,000 patients. It's a big trial. And this is just the study design. Any patient with a melanoma greater than a millimeter, and then the patient would be randomized to either a one centimeter margin and lymph node staging or to a two centimeter margin and lymph node staging. So moving on to the lymph nodes, uh, we have um, the sentinel node biopsy was introduced in the late 90s. Um, and depending on the depth of the melanoma, it will depend on what the likelihood is of having the melanoma spread from the primary to the nearest lymph node basin. If the melanoma is quite thin, if it's less than a millimeter in depth, then overall you're looking at a, around a 5% chance of lymph node involvement. When we get to the melanoma between one and four millimeters, it's about a 20% chance of lymph node involvement. And as uh, many of us are aware in this room, if you do have lymph node involvement, then it changes your treatment substantially. You'll be a candidate for adjuvant therapies. We'll probably do some CT scans to just uh, do a baseline staging. And then you'll talk to the surgeon about maybe doing some more surgery. So as, we, as I already mentioned, the uh, sentinel node is the first lymph <coughs> nodes to which an area of skin drains to. So if the melanoma is on the arm, it typically um, drains to the armpit. If it's on the leg, it drains to the groin. If it's on the trunk, it can go pretty much anywhere. And that's why we do um, a fancy picture at the same time as the sentinel node. We do a lymphocentigogram, which tells us where the sentinel nodes are. So this is one of the uh, fancy pictures, which are really just blurry pictures. This is a patient with his hands above his head like this, and the melanoma is in the middle of the chest. And these are the sentinel nodes in both armpits. And um, this is the injection with the radioactive dye. In the operating room, we inject a blue dye to help us find the uh, sentinel nodes as well. And then we remove those at the same time as the wide local excision. So why do we do this? Um, this was the, the reason that we do the sentinel node um, or the data to support it comes from a big study called the MSLT1 study where patients were randomized to either wide local excision alone or to wide local excision and the sentinel node biopsy. If the sentinel node was positive, then patients went on to have the rest of their lymph nodes removed. They had a completion lymph node dissection. 
in the wide local excision arm, um, these patients, if they developed lymph nodes that were palpable, so I could feel a, um, a lump in a lymph node basin, then they went on to a completion, they went on to have those lymph nodes removed when they were big and palpable. And what we found in that study, um, the 10-year follow-up, was that the nodal positivity rates were about the same in each group. They were about 20%. So whether you um, had microscopic or macroscopic amounts of disease, um, it was similar. And what we found that if, if you had the sentinel node biopsy done, then um, it was better in terms of outcomes. So it seemed like interrupting that, um, that pathway made patients' outcomes better. And that's why we do it. So the sentinel node gives us better staging. It gives us better local regional control. Um, patients are less likely to require radiation if they've had very small amounts of disease in their lymph nodes. Um, they qualify for adjuvant trials if the sentinel nodes are positive, and it's better survival if we find the disease earlier rather than later. And the Cancer Care Ontario guideline says that anyone with a melanoma <coughs> greater than a millimeter in depth should have that discussion about the sentinel node biopsy. And there are similar statements from the American groups as well. So what are the side effects? Probably some people in this room had side effects with the procedure. Um, there's a very small risk of lymphedema with a sentinel node biopsy, small risk of wound infection. But in general, it's a pretty well-tolerated procedure. If the sentinel node is positive, this leads us to kind of the next step about what we do after that. And this is a little bit of a moving target at the present time. We know that about 20% of patients will have further disease in their lymph nodes if they've had a sentinel node that's positive. And this study, the uh, multicenter lymphad lymphadenectomy trial part two, is trying to sort out is whether we need to do more surgery or not. So this study was another large study. It took about 2,000 patients from around the world. And this took patients who were sentinel node positive. And it randomized them to either ultrasound follow-up or to surgery. And we won't have the results for a few years from this study. But we do have uh, results that just came out from in this year at the ASCO meeting in 2015 in a smaller German study that gives us a hint of um, what will, what will become probably a uh, standard of care. So in this study, they took patients who had um, positive sentinel nodes between the ages of 18 and 75. And these patients were randomized either to surgery or to no surgery. And there were about 1,270 patients and overall in each arm when it all broke down. Um, it was about 200 patients. What they found was there was no groups between the observation, no difference in the groups who had observation versus completion dissection. And what they found was that there was no difference in terms of overall survival, whether you had that further surgery, that second surgery, removing the rest of the lymph nodes, or whether you just went under, whether you were just followed clinically with observation. So patients who had the, the Bigger surgery in this study did not live longer, which is, um, which is nice because the bigger surgery has more side effects associated with it. We've been uh, offering no surgery with ultrasound follow-up for a number of years now, so it's always reassuring. And this, this um, slide just again shows there was no difference in distant recurrence whether you had the surgery or not when you had a positive sentinel node. So what we currently do is we offer the surgery until we have the final big study, but we also ob offer a close observation with ultrasound monitoring. If you do choose to have the surgery, it's uh, axillary dissection. If it's in the groin lymph nodes, then we do something called the groin dissection. If you come in and you have now a switching gears to patients who have larger deposits of melanoma in their lymph nodes, and as you can see, this is a very large mass in the uh, lymph nodes, if this is found on clinical exam, then we do a biopsy in clinic. We do do staging at this time. It may be a PET scan, it may be CT scans. And patients will, when they have disease that we can feel in clinic, they'll have a full 
axillary dissection, or they'll have what we call a superficial and deep groin dissection, removing all the lymph nodes in that lymph node basin. But that's if you have disease that we can feel in clinic. This is, uh, this is not for patients who have positive sentinel nodes. Um, some of the new um, drugs that we have, when patients come in with palpable disease, if you are BRAF positive, then we're now starting to give patients um, treatment before the surgery, and it can shrink things down very nicely, and um, it makes the surgery much easier for us and makes the surgery more likely to be um, successful. So this is one of the newer things that we're doing with, um, with systemic treatment and with um, surgery. And moving on to um, something a little bit different. This is um, something unique to melanoma. Um, in transit disease is uh, deposits of melanoma between the primary site and the nearest uh, lymph node basin. So if someone had a melanoma on their ankle, their nearest lymph node basin would be in their groin. And then if they get little deposits of melanoma on the leg, that would be considered in transit disease. This, is, um, this happens to about 3 to 10% of patients with melanoma greater than a millimeter in depth. And with this, the, um, the, f the prognosis is anywhere from 25 to 50% survival at five years. But we have some interesting new data with this. So what are the treatment options for in-transit melanoma? If there's only one or two deposits, then we'll just remove them. What we've been doing um, for the last probably around five or six years now is using a drug called interleukin-2. And we inject this into the in-transit metastases in clinic. This uh, medication gives us a complete response in about 30 to 40% of patients. And if you have a complete response to this medication, then um, patients tend to do very well um, over time, over years. The disease does not seem to come back. We also started using um, a different medication for, this, um, for the in-transit metastases in the fall of this year. We're using something called DCPC cream. Um, in one study, the response rate was 46%, which is probably a bit high. It's probably closer to 30%. So these are the treatments that we're offering at Sunnybrook at the moment. The other treatments, especially used in the US, um, give similar results, but they're a lot more morbid. So they, they do something called limb perfusion or limb infusion, and they put chemotherapy into the arm or the leg. Um, and that can have some fairly significant side effects. So the interleukin-2 that we, we uh, inject, um, we do it every couple of weeks in the clinic. The side effects are fairly minimal, um, fever and chills, maybe fatigue for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, the oldest patient I've treated with this is 87, so it really can be tolerated quite well. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be a very good treatment. The other treatment that we started to use, as I mentioned, is the DCPC cream. Uh, this cream is put onto the, onto the in-transit metastases. It stays on for 12 to 24 hours. It's wiped off. And uh, then the next week, uh, the patient can do this at home. Um, and then uh, the next week, same thing happens. You just put it on for another 12 to 24 hours. This is my final uh, set of slides. It's looking at distant metastases and, uh, of melanoma and surgery. So there are a number of trials looking at patients with uh, distant metastases with melanoma, so lung, liver, um, skin metastases. Um, and what we found is if we can resect all of the disease, um, and especially if the patient gets systemic therapy as well, some patients can have long-term cure from their melanoma. So in this, um, in this initial trial in 2006, uh, patients had both surgery and an immunotherapy, or just the surgery alone. And these are patients with metastatic disease. Um, and the survival in that um, study was about 40%, which is very high for metastatic melanoma. In a, what they found in this study was that if you had fewer sites of disease, then patients did better. In another study um, looking at uh, the cohort of patients in MSLT1, they had about 290 patients who developed distant metastases, 
And uh, they found, again, that if you could resect all of that disease and if you got some kind of systemic therapy from uh, your medical oncologist, five-year survival was about 20%. So I think the message here is if you do develop distant metastases, you should see if the disease is resectable or not, and, um, and then also consider um, whole body or systemic treatment as well. And especially patients who had skin or subcutaneous metastases, um, they did very well with the combination of surgery and systemic therapy. So you're looking at about a 70%. This was four-year survival data. So in conclusion, melanoma is increasing. Surgeons play a key role in all stages of melanoma uh, patients' treatment. Um, standard of care to discuss uh, sentinel node biopsy for any patient with a melanoma greater than a millimeter in depth. We've got many new, less morbid um, options for in-transit metastases. And um, we have options for patients with distant metastatic disease. And of course, we work in concert with our medical oncologists with all of these treatments. Thank you.